I want to say welcome. This is our first FCIA meeting of 2023. I'm glad you all could join us today. For those of you that do not know, I'm Suzette Reynolds. I'm the Interfaith Coordinator with Fairfax County. Um, it's a position that is housed within the Department of Neighborhood and Community Services. We have a pretty packed agenda today, uh, but before we begin, we're going to start with an opening prayer from Reverend Trish Hall. She is the spiritual director for the Center, the Center for Living Metro, and she's also the Programs and Outreach Committee um, Chair with Tyson's Interfaith. Reverend Trish. Thank you. And so please join me as we bless this gathering this evening. I am so grateful for the opportunity to open our meeting this evening. We are blessed as we gather together from many faith traditions, honoring, excuse me, honoring the creator of all that is. We draw on the wisdom and guidance of the one. We eagerly open to learning from and with one another so that we may take what we learn in this meeting and serve God by serving community using the relationships we strengthen this evening to enrich our interfaith bonds and support everyone here in Fairfax County and far beyond. May God broaden our connections, guide us in our listening, lead us in our learning, and bring us to clarity as to what is ours to do individually and collectively. And so it is. Amen. Thank you, Reverend Trish. So this evening, we are fortunate to have with us Deputy County Executive Christopher Leonard, who will provide an overview of the Fairfax County's Health and Human Services System. Then we will hear from Supervisor Rodney Lusk of the Franconia District, and he will give us information on the Workforce Innovation Skills Hub, and we will hear from Thomas Barnett, the Deputy Director of the Department of Housing and Community Development, and he will discuss the Home ARP Allocation Plan. And as we typically do, we would like to hear from you. Can you please put your name and the faith community that you're representing in the chat? So we can all see who's here with us today. And while you're introducing yourselves in the chat, I want to encourage everyone to participate, to ask questions. We want to make this a dialogue. Um, I've noticed that we have a diverse group of uh, participants today. We have some nonprofit representatives. Um, we have representatives from different county agencies, as well as the faith community. And we would like to remind everyone that this presentation is geared towards the faith community. So we humbly ask that you defer to them um, with your comments and questions. And I see we have quite a few people representing quite a few um, different faith traditions. So now we will go over the group agreements. Um, as you all have probably seen, this meeting will be recorded. Please do not record on your cell phone or any other device. Be present, fully present and open to learning. Ask questions to better understand. Engage in dialogue. And we ask that you respect confidentiality. Please take the stories, but leave the names. Mm -hmm. And now I would like to turn it over to Deputy Director, Deputy County Executive Christopher Leonard. Thank you, Suzette. Can you hear me? Yes, we can okay, hear. You. Thank you, Suzette, and uh, thank you, Trish, for that beautiful start. Um, really uh, grateful for the invite to come and share with you a little bit today. Um, I've got my colleague Jill Clark is with me, and she's going to help me with uh, with the PowerPoint. We'll try to get through this fairly quickly, so I can uh, uh, certainly it's going to generate some questions, and I want to make sure we have plenty of time for some Q and A afterwards. So, um, but again, thank you for for your your time and. Uh, Thank you for all your service um, uh, throughout the years. I used to be the director of neighborhood and community services, and that's always been the home of our faith coordination efforts. So I kind of go old school a little bit. I know Suzette's doing a wonderful job, um, but I'm pretty proud that Fairfax has had uh, this coordination effort 
for uh, a couple decades now and has been very successful and uh, certainly want to continue to pick up and, and march on and, and, and do great things. So uh, thank you for your time tonight. So we'll get started with uh, uh, standard, our mission, vision, uh, and guiding principles for our health and human services system. Just a couple points I want to highlight here for you that um, everybody's probably heard the term safety net. I mean, growing up, uh, safety net is, is a uh, term that is fairly familiar to most folks. Um, if that's all we're thought of, we're, we're losing something. Um, we want to be thought of as, as um, uh, a, a group of organizations within this county that seeks to not only provide a, a hand, a helping hand, but a hand and a lift up, because we want to make sure that folks have every opportunity to be uh, a successful, um, thriving member of the community. And we're incredibly blessed. Blessed is probably a word I use very, very frequently in my uh, talks to the community. We're very blessed to be in a community like Fairfax, uh, because we have not only um, a government that is very well supported, our board of supervisors, and I know you have one here tonight that are very supportive of, of our efforts, but uh, perhaps more importantly, we have a, a tremendously caring and empathetic community. Uh, 1.2 million people in Fairfax, but it feels like a small town because when there's a need within the community, the community steps up huge. Uh, we see that over and over again, and I'll give a, a quick shout out to our, our Stuff the Bus food campaign that we've been doing every year for 11 years. I think I read somewhere over 200 and some tons of food over the last decade plus. Um, well, that started this past um, weekend. Uh, and that continued right through the pandemic where people were afraid of gathering together, um, but people still showed up and we made it possible for folks to be able to, um, to be able to participate and give back. So uh, I wanted to, I just wanted to highlight that, that we're, we're more than just safety net. We're also seeking through our programs and services um, to, to create thriving opportunities for our community members. How do we do that? Trying to address root causes, promoting equity and providing a voice to the voiceless. Um, I know this, uh, people on this call have been extraordinarily helpful through the years on that uh, to make sure that we're intentionally going to seek um, the the uh, comments, thoughts, ideas of our community members, of all of our community members, not just those that we say, okay, we had a meeting here, you got to come here. We're, we're looking at ways to try to make sure that we give everybody a voice. Um, uh, and that's, that's for everything, through the identification of needs to the identification of how we're going to go about meeting those needs. Uh, all of our community members uh, deserve a voice, and that's that's what we uh, seek to do with human services. Using resources judiciously, I did say we're blessed. We are blessed that we're pretty well resourced, uh, but that it's not an endless spigot. Um, that we have to make sure that we are um, uh, using data to be able to address um, needs um, in, in our in our um, overall use of resources in the in the most impactful manner. And I'm pretty pretty happy that we do that very well in Fairfax. And uh, we do that because again, it's not just the government agencies that you'll see engaging in these resource discussions. It's our nonprofits, it's our faith-based community, it's our business communities that will talk about resource investments. And again, considering resource, considering our return on investment and uh, an opportunity. So that, that's a little bit about our mission and vision and kind of what guides us. Our next slide, we'll go over our health and human services organization, just a few highlights here. I want you to take the time to read. I mean, obviously we've got uh, pictures of, of everybody. These are all the directors and the names of the directors, but look at the names of the uh, of the organizations. You've got our health department, family services, housing. Um, those are your traditional, you'll see a traditional safety net services there, but you also see libraries, park authority, community centers um, that, are, that are listed there as well. And we all work together to create not only a safety net that, that again, provides that hand up, but also uh, a lift up of, of, our, um, of all of our community members. And that's what we're, that's what we're striving for. I uh, also wanted to highlight the stakeholders and partners on the right side. You'll see that it's a lot of people, <laughs> obviously faith-based organizations, but we take it very seriously that uh, the, and, and I think it was proven um, in, in tenfold in the pandemic, that our ability to provide for our community members, especially our most vulnerable community members, is directly proportionate to um, the strength of our relationships and our partnerships in the community. And that showed up 
again, tenfold with the pandemic because of what we did. And, and I'll be able to um, talk a little bit more about that in, in this next slide. Our network of community partners, uh, obviously our nonprofits, our faith base. Um, I just want to mention that as part of the pandemic response, obviously the federal government stepped in large with, with a lot of support across the country. Um, we distributed well over a hundred million dollars of, of um, food, rent assistance, uh, basic needs assistance to our uh, communities in need. And we only were able to do that very quickly uh, and very efficiently because of our pre-existing relationship with all of our uh, nonprofit and faith-based uh, uh, community members. Um, I, so much so that throughout my tenure as deputy county executive, um, a lot of my Northern Virginia uh, colleagues have talked to me about how do you set that up? How do you have such a strong network of, of volunteers, nonprofits, and faith-based organizations? And I said, well, first of all, you, you start 25 years ago, right? So we have we have the benefit that we, we've been doing this and nurturing it and investing for years. Um, you don't wait until there's a a uh, hundred year pandemic to say, oh my gosh, we need to we need to bring in a bunch of partners. But now you, what you need to do is go in and, and do the yearly annual investments um, in, in terms of time and yes, in terms of resources, in, uh, in terms of being able to provide supports for our valuable community organizations. So um, that that is probably the, the biggest success that I'm most proud of from the pandemic. I wish we never had the pandemic. But I think, um, and I think our board of supervisors clearly sees that as well because they've recognized our nonprofits uh, a, a couple times now in, in terms of a pandemic response. Uh, but our our ability in Fairfax County to have a quality uh, response for our most vulnerable community members was only because of the strength of our nonprofits. Uh, I'm certain we would have responded just like everybody around here responded, but our ability to be able to pivot very quickly um, is is directly responsible is directly related to all of our uh, relationships with our uh, community providers. So I just wanted to highlight that. Our next slide, we talk a little bit about uh, guiding frameworks and planning tools. We do have a number of things: um, strategic plan, uh, task force, and equity opportunity. Obviously, coming out of the pandemic, we have an economic recovery framework. All of these things are linked, or all of them are aligned. So. Um, that's that's really important. But one umbrella that I want to make sure that I share is in the bottom right hand corner there in our one Fairfax policy that that is specific to ensuring that we're providing equitable opportunities uh, and, and um, chances for all of our community members to be able to uh, to be able to rise. Um, and uh, I think uh, our chief equity officer, Carla Bruce, who also was with me in neighborhood and community services for many years. Um, she uh, quickly coined a phrase that we all do better when we all do better. Uh, and that is the essence of, of collective impact. And so that's what we kind of uh, focus on. The other thing I'll talk about with this page is in, in Fairfax, we're incredibly blessed, again, that's that word, to have a very data rich environment. So we have a number of opportunities through um, either our every three years uh, older adult survey or our every year youth survey, um, or just our, our the way which we collect and receive data to be able to get that and synthesize it and be able to make decisions, in a lot of cases, resource decisions based on data. Um, so I, I wanna highlight that as part of this because as you get an opportunity to go through, and I encourage you all of you to go through um, these at your, at your leisure, but I think you'll see uh, the emphasis that we have on data uh, throughout all of these uh, things to be able to to be able to make sure that we're um, advancing in in the in the way in which the data is telling us to advance. Uh, I did want to talk a little bit about our human services uh, focal areas. Um, I'll, I'll start with even though it's second here affordable housing and I'll start with affordable housing because we consider that to be foundational. If you don't have a stable um, uh, home environment wherever that may be, um, that uh, it really makes everything else for an individual and particularly a family um, if you don't have a stable uh, affordable housing or affordable home environment. So uh, we, we focus on that as, as foundational. Uh, youth behavioral health, our youth survey that I mentioned earlier, we had a significant jump in the first 
post-pandemic survey that was taken last year, but it was released earlier. Well, actually, um, it was released early or I guess mid-2022. Well, we had a significant jump in youth with uh, depressive symptoms, experiencing depressive symptoms in the last 30 days, uh, and certainly uh, suicide ideation. Um, I want to say, don't quote me on the numbers, but I want to say it went from 29% to 38%, which I've been following the youth survey, which I've always said is a gold mine. Everybody should have access to the youth survey data because it comes out every year. And it's and it's a survey of the whole. Uh, so every, every student, every 8th, 10th, and 12th grader are taking that survey every year. So it, it provides a nice little trend line. Um, those trends, the negative behaviors, the positive behaviors, you'll see You'll see fluctuations from year to year, maybe one, maybe 2% at a time. Um, but to go up uh, at that extent um, clearly was, was related to the pandemic and um, is, puts, puts a spotlight there. Um, likewise, opioids and substance abuse uh, or substance use um, is, is clearly community-wide, it's nationwide, uh, but it's also, we're seeing it as, as crept into our schools. Uh, so we're working with our school system, and actually, if you're interested uh, at our Health and Human Services Committee of the Board of Supervisors, on February 28th, we'll be doing a presentation on both youth behavioral health and opioids and substance use uh, to be able to um, update our board on uh, with the data we're seeing and also what we're doing about that. And then early childhood, I think I think it's very important to mention this. Uh, certainly with our new super uh, superintendent, I've had a, a number of discussions with her. She is a champion of early childhood efforts. I, I uh, saw the press release of her of her budget last year uh, last week, and uh, she's actually proposing additional funds uh, to go into early childhood uh, because that that is I mean she understands this. We understand it that the achievement gaps don't start when they're in kindergarten. The achievement gaps our kids are showing up on our kindergarten doorstep already with those gaps developed. So uh, we need to do a better job in, in our early childhood efforts and we're, we're focused on those as well. So those are kind of our current and immediate, if you will, um, term uh, focal areas within health and human services. I did wanna take some time to talk about a little bit about our cross system strategic initiatives, just a couple of highlights. Uh, that community provider strategy team is something that we started um, as part of the pandemic era. Uh, to be able to bring all of our providers, faith-based, community-based, um, to be able to bring come together and hear directly what our issues and the challenges are, to be able to work together to figure out how we're going to address those. That is so successful that we're going to continue that post-pandemic. Um, so uh, I wanted to highlight that as a way, again, to, to treat our community uh, providers as uh, equal to all of our agencies. So my, my philosophy, as soon as I get the information and data, I want you to have the information and data. So you can see what we're dealing with. And, you know, nobody's, nobody's got a, a, anybody's got a great idea to do something. We want to hear it so we can uh, all get behind it. Uh, also eviction prevention and intervention. That's when I mentioned earlier that we spent well over a hundred million dollars um, in support of folks during our pandemic um, supports that eviction prevention and intervention was where about uh, the, the great majority of that money went to prevent evictions and, um, and to do some legal interventions as well. So we're pretty proud of that. Because um, again, it's one thing for the federal government to, to spend and invest a lot of money like they did, but it's another thing to make sure that you're maximizing that. And I'm, I'm quite certain that, that we were able to do that over the last three years. Um, Healthy Minds Fairfax and our successful children and youth policy team uh, again, that, that we'll be talking a lot about those things uh, coming up at our February um, Health and Human Services Committee meeting of the board. Um, our SKIPT, which is what we call our Successful Children and Youth Policy Team, um, I just wanted to give a highlight there because it's, it is very successful. We have two board members that sit on that policy team and two school board members and a, a number of um, school administrators, a uh, number of county administrators, a lot of the directors you saw earlier are on that policy team. Uh, Supervisor Lusk, who's going to be talking uh, soon, um, is on that team. Uh, these are the five areas that we're really focused on. I, I, I understand he's going to talk a little bit about workforce readiness ton, uh, tonight, and there's some exciting things going on there. But you can see kind of how all of these things align because all of this, all these efforts are kind of uh, intertwined with what we're trying to do around um, uh, advancing um, uh, opportunities for our youth. 
the next thing I just wanted to highlight, because I know this is definitely not, um, not anything new to any of the folks on this call, but uh, we actually can track data to show data with all of the 200 and some questions, or however many questions we have, we can show data that the, the kids that are exhibiting the positive behaviors and less negative behaviors are the ones that have access to more positive factors in their lives. Specifically, uh, parent, teacher, coach, clergy, uh, friends, whatever, um, you, you give, you introduce positive influence into kids' lives, and it's not a shock that you'll see throughout the rest of the survey results that uh, those, those uh, positive uh, factors that are the positive outcomes you want in their lives, academic performance, social um, uh, behavior, all of that tends to increase when, when you have um, uh, positive factors, positive and protective factors in lives. So I just wanted to highlight that. Uh, if you ever get a chance, again, the youth survey, I believe um, it's, it's like nothing else in, in the Northern Virginia area uh, because it does provide a lot of data uh, for, uh, for anybody that wants to go and, and view it. I'm a parent of three daughters, so it was, it was also helpful to me as I was, as I was raising my uh, three daughters with my wife. So um, what can we, uh, what, what's coming and, and how can you help? Uh, this is specific to short-term immediate. In addition to the, 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 the focal areas that I talked about, we just updated our board last week on um, the ending of the COVID-19 uh, policy waivers for Medicaid and SNAP. Uh, basically, during, during the COVID um, time, we were not able to do the regular um, evaluations to uh, see if people were still eligible for, for Medicaid and or SNAP. Um, and those are for obvious reasons uh, with the pandemic. Uh, we've been notified and we've been preparing this for well over a year, uh, but we've been notified that our Medicaid renewals are going to begin in April. Uh, our SNAP is going to probably start in March. Um, where folks, and you can see that last bullet, uh, folks are currently receiving about $545 a month in, in benefits and SNAP. That's going to go down by over 200 on average. So obviously, these things are going to be kind of a jolt. Personally, I mean, I'm not at the federal level, but I'm certain this is probably why they've, they've wanted to put this off as long as possible to make sure that we're well on the other side of the pandemic, because of uh, just kind of the jolt of, again, 17% of Medicaid recipients. Well, when, when you got over 100,000 Medicaid recipients in Fairfax County, 17% is a lot of people. Um, similarly, 27,000 households losing a couple hundred bucks a month that they've been used to receiving over the last two and a half years. That's, that's a jolt. So um, I'm just highlighting that for you um, because we are working on, certainly there's no way that we can step in for the uh, for the federal government and the amount of money that they were spending. But we can certainly uh, continue and enhance and uh, increase our, uh, for instance, our food um, access efforts. Um, and, and we've done a lot of that over the pandemic, but we can certainly do more. Uh, we've got we've got structures, infrastructure to be able to do that. Uh, a lot of you are, are part of that uh, as well. So um, these are things that are coming up that are kind of going to kind of be jolting to our community that uh, certainly we're going to want our nonprofit providers and our faith-based communities to be aware of and to be part of uh, helping us with uh, providing um, uh, our folks with as safe uh, as safe as landing as possible. I mean, again, it's, it's a pretty big jolt, but uh, we can work together to collectively try to soften that landing as best we possibly can. Um, the last thing is just connection to services. I always like to have this so you have it. I tell everybody, if you're in Fairfax County, you're not sure where to go. 222-0880 is, is your best uh, place to go, and they'll make sure that, you, that you'll be able to get them uh, to get where you need to be. Uh, primarily, that's for our um, emergency benefits needs. If, if somebody needs help with transportation, help with uh, food, uh, rent assistance, those sorts of things, that's the number to call. But that, that's the number I primarily tell folks because it's easy to remember. And then our behavioral health resources, which are so important across the county, uh, especially with our youth. Um, this is a national suicide and crisis lifeline. So it's not just suicide uh, to call uh, 988. 
Um, we've also got a 573 number there to get you local. Um, but the 988 number is good to be able to uh, help people that are in crisis. Um, and, and I think that's uh, uh, something that, that we've done that uh, we're part of, obviously, that's across the country. It makes it a little bit easier, again, especially for our youth that are in crisis that tend to look at problems as though they're permanent problems, not temporary problems. And, uh, and unfortunately, sometimes they make bad decisions um, when, they, when they view a temporary problem as a permanent problem. So we want to make sure that we get those numbers out as well. So that's my presentation. I'm sure I went long, but uh, I can answer any questions that's, that you may have. And I just want to say thank you so much for everybody. I know a lot of folks on the call. I know what you've done through the years, and I, and I really appreciate it on behalf of all of us in, uh, in Fairfax County Health and Human Services. Anyone have any questions for Chris? Can we ask questions, Suzette? Because I forgot to yep. send it in. Yep, you can ask as many questions as you want to, Fabio. Okay, I'm just gonna pull up my question. Um, so my question is this, and you might have answered it already, and I'm so sorry. I'm tr I was trying to do too many things at one time, but at Dara Hidra. We get, and I don't know if social services is on this call, but I'm outreach and we get a lot of calls and I'm so glad I jumped on because I had a long day today and I wasn't going to, but I'm so glad you gave such a good presentation and it's good for all the reminders of things we already know. So um, we get a lot of landlord tenant issues and you did touch on that. What are the best contacts for when people are having and you may have said it, eviction, you said, I heard you say eviction prevention, legal intervention, but uh, we also have landlord bullying. Um, what are your recommendations to how to handle those types of questions that come in? So I think while we're, while we're still in, the, thank you. Thank you for the question. It's a great question. Um, I think while we're still in this process of trying to prevent uh, evictions and, and the type of bullying that you're talking about, uh, it's probably best to go through our 222 line um, because a couple of reasons. I like pe passing people through our 222 line because not only can they get you help around the eviction piece, but these are all social workers. So they will take you through a series of questions that maybe the client doesn't even know that is available to be able to ask other questions. So maybe they had no idea that we could also solve their transportation problem, right? So I, I, I think it's still best to go through the 222 line. And then if there's specific things related to our housing uh, department that, that maybe need to be uh, a filed complaint, we can help walk through that and walk through the kind of a warm handoff to our, uh, to our housing folks. So it's the 222, okay. Yes. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Chris, there's a question in the chat. Has CSP received county bridge funds for use with rental and utility assistance? A CSP, CSP or CSB? CSP, the- The, 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 the 222 <coughs> one. Yes, that's the question says CSP. Yes. So one of the things that we did get uh, that, that our board is, uh, has uh, allocated is uh, bridge programming for we went from about $68 million in federal dollars for eviction prevention to what we had pre-pandemic, which is about four or five million dollars, right? Um, so obviously going from 68 to four or five was not gonna be something that, that uh, was gonna help us stair step down. Um, so um, we, we have gotten uh, through our uh, American Recovery Act funding an additional $10 million, or actually it was a little, a little less than that because uh, U.S. Treasury um, was able to give us some other funds from other jurisdictions were, which were not used. Um, but the bottom line is we got an additional $10 million to be able to overwhelmingly provide that rental assistance, but also to provide some of the legal assistance through our nonprofits um, uh, for, for individuals who are in need. So that will help us with the stair step down. Then the plan is... Um, knowing that we can't go back to the pre-pandemic level of funding, right? That's, we could, 
but that would not come anywhere near meeting the need. I think the uh, idea is maybe in 24, which is next year, to continue to use ARPA dollars um, and then eventually um, have the board uh, consider as part of uh, the next budget cycle um, an additional dollar amount to be able to provide, in essence, a new foundational level for rent assistance post-pandemic, if any of that makes sense. So, so the bottom line is, yes, we've gotten some bridge funding. We got the bridge funding we asked for. So I don't want to, it didn't, nobody, <laughs> we asked for the dollar amount. Um, and we were able to, the only thing the budget office asked us to do is wait and let's see how much the Department of Treasury reallocates to us from other jurisdictions. Um, and then there was a commitment that the Delta would, would bring us back up to the $10 million, which is where we are now for the bridge funding. Okay, does anyone have any other questions? Um, there's still some questions in the chat, but I wanna give other people a chance to ask if they have a question. Tommy? You're muted. I can, is that, is the question in the chat? I can ask if you're muted. Yeah, please, please do that. Thank you. Okay. Um, in which areas or zip codes of the county are the service gaps of fam or families needs most pronounced? Well, we definitely have that. And instead of me uh, um, try, trying to um, make sure that we're getting all the zip codes um, right, um, what I would suggest is let me get that to you, Suzette, tomorrow. Okay. Um, and we'll give you a uh, a good map that is that breaks down the entire county. That's basically a heat map that will be able to show you where some of the uh, some of the gaps are. I don't think any of the gaps would be surprising. Whenever we do a heat map, it's uh, unfortunately it's generally the areas that we're aware we're aware of, and that our partners are aware of. But it's definitely helpful to be able to see it in a uh, graphic representation. So I'll make sure you get that tomorrow, Suzette, and then maybe you can send that out to everybody who's on the call. Okay, Tommy. I just just to follow up. How do you then target your services, and how should we be targeting our services? Well, I think definitely through um, through your contacts with our faith coordinator um, to make sure that it's connected to whatever whatever efforts. So, for instance, if we're doing something targeted towards food, uh, we're making sure that other providers um, in the area are all coordinated to provide. Um, to provide that access. If it's something around rent assistance that you can provide, or I know a lot of faith communities can provide additional supports like uh, um, uh, like um, furniture provision. If people are just moving into the area and, and don't have, uh, can't, uh, can't furnish their uh, apartment, uh, if they can get an apartment. Um, so I would work through Suzette and the faith uh, coordination, and then that makes sure that we can get out to not only the human services agencies in the county, but also our other nonprofit partners that are in the in the community to make sure that, because again, resources, part of judiciously reason, utilizing resources, making sure we're not overlapping. So we wanna make sure our partners that have finite resources um, are, are not overlapping in their services. So I would work through our uh, faith office and then uh, that gets you connected to the rest of the county and the rest of our nonprofit partners. Thank you. Thanks for that question, Tommy. Does anyone else have any questions? And this will be recorded and it will be, uh, the link will be sent out um, after the meeting is over this week. It doesn't appear that there are any more questions. Well, so Suzette, if I could, I would just say that if you, if you have any questions after, after you get a chance to review this or once we send the, that uh, map out tomorrow, uh, certainly don't hesitate to give me a call. Uh, reach out to Suzette. Suzette's got me on speed dial. Um, so she, anytime she needs me, she can get me. Um, and uh, just know that uh, I we so appreciate all of the supports that you provide to our community. And we look forward to many years uh, working together in the future. Thank you. So now we will move, and we also wanna thank you, uh, Chris, for such a thorough presentation. There was a comment in the chat that um, thanked you as well for the presentation. 
So now we will move to Supervisor Lusk uh, to talk about the Workforce Innovation Skills Hub or the WISH Center as it is affectionately known. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Suzette and Ramona for the opportunity to be here. And I'll uh, say very clearly here, I also wanna uh, commend and thank um, all of you here representing the faith community for your support of the broader community. And I can say uh, during the pandemic, uh, we uh, here in uh, formerly Lee District, now Franconia District, had many supports, uh, particularly in helping us address some of the food insecurity issues and could not have done it without the dedicated and uh, diligent commitment on behalf of so many here in, uh, in our county and specifically uh, in this uh, area of South County. So I represent uh, 130,000 residents uh, who are in the Franconia District. Uh, it is kind of bounded by Richmond Highway on its uh, eastern uh, boundary and it comes uh, far west to Springfield. So if you're familiar where uh, uh, Green Spring Village, and just a couple of communities just west of it, they're a part of uh, this district. And I'll say that as a person who spent uh, 30 years in county government before becoming an elected member of the Board of Supervisors, I had the opportunity to work for two board members. I also had the opportunity to work in human services, providing direct service delivery on the Richmond Highway Corridor and saw some of the issues and, and some of the um, you know, inequities in terms of quality of life and some of the really hardships that many uh, residents in our community have to have to bear. And that never left me, uh, even uh, as, a, as a young person working in Fairfax County. I then went on to work for uh, uh, then member of the Board of Supervisors, Jerry Conley, and uh, following that worked in economic development for 21 years, got the opportunity to help recruit companies into Fairfax. And that's where I learned about this um, kind of divide, for lack of a better word, as it relates to the northern and western parts of Fairfax County, having the preponderance of companies. So you look at the largest technology companies, the largest systems integrators, or the largest uh, Fortune 500 other companies that are located, Tyson's, Reston, Herndon. When you look at the Richmond Highway Corridor, you look at the companies that are here, and it's a totally different complexion, totally different uh, base and type. And unfortunately, that is a reflection of why our community has struggled to be able to um, meet their expenses and to be able to live a middle-class lifestyle. And as a result of that, we've spent the last three years looking for ways to develop a workforce innovation and skills hub in a community that is an opportunity neighborhood that has members of our Latinx community or African-American community who are, you know, if you look at the average incomes, making a third, almost a third of what others are making in uh, average incomes in Fairfax County. And the reason is many of those folks are working in retail jobs that pay them only a minimum wage makes it harder for them to be able to competitively uh, get jobs um, outside of this region. So this center is focused on providing training, education, and employment so that those residents have the opportunity to uplift themselves and move into jobs that pay at least $20 per hour. And we're focused on making that uh, a reality. The way that we've established that opportunity is to work directly with companies like Capital One, Dominion Energy, Amazon Web Services. We've worked with every single one of the building trades in the DC metro region to get their commitment, their commitment that they will help our residents get through their it's basically a pre apprenticeship program. And if they qualify to the pre-apprenticeship program, they can go into their apprenticeship for electrical, welding, um, carpentry, you name that specific apprenticeship opportunity, they'll have uh, the option to do it. So 
we have just opened the center uh, back in October 8th, and uh, we've had an opportunity to uh, sign up now about 120, 130 individuals into this WISH program. And we've done a number of uh, trainings already, which have resulted in people getting jobs. We have um, Anova Health has just finished a patient navigator program. That patient navigator program had uh, 20 uh, residents who are from the Hyblo Valley community able to come to that program after four weeks, 11 of them were offered full-time employment and they'll be making at least uh, $38,000 to $40,000 a year. This is a game changer for people who were making minimum wage. This is so, so important. And what we are trying to do is really change the trajectory of individuals' lives. And we believe that this model is a way to do that. Um, right now, we are working with the Carpenters Union. They just started a program in the center uh, last Saturday. We had uh, about 17 uh, males, and we have one female, who are a part of this Saturday program that will be for eight weeks. Through this program, they're going to teach basic carpentry skills to those residents. When they complete the eight weeks, the Carpenters Union is going to offer apprenticeships to a number of those folks. And when they go into that apprenticeship program, they will be paid while they are in the apprenticeship program. And then once they graduate, they'll go into a full-time job. And that job will pay at least $20 to $24 per hour. So I'm here basically to let all of you know that this program exists. And this is a program that we would... Uh, love to support residents, particularly those who are in kind of the Mount Vernon uh, district, uh, now Franconia district, formerly Lee district um, area. But you've also committed that there will be some individuals um, who might meet um, some requirements for service that might be outside that area. And we're certainly open to talking to those who are interested in learning more about the program um, I'll make a couple of quick points that the program is being uh, administered uh, by Melwood. So Melwood is a um, disability services organization that has been providing employment and training services for over 50 years in this community very successfully. They have a subcontract with Building Momentum, which is a local uh, veteran-owned firm based in Alexandria City that teaches design thinking. Design thinking is really important because it helps people learn how to solve complex and difficult problems. And this sort of training is going to help a number of our residents as they go out on interviews. They'll be able to explain to potential employers how they have used design thinking to solve a problem. And it won't be just theoretical. It will actually be practical. So we just appreciate the opportunity to have these partnerships. And we also will say within the program, we understand that there's going to be a need to provide intensive case management. So there are case managers who are assigned to each person who comes uh, through the program. Uh, they do a pretty intensive intake to kind of understand what the individual's kind of interest, background, and experience uh, has been, and then to customize a program specifically for them to determine which area uh, they might want to consider for, a train, for training and for employment. And I think what's also really important about the program that we have uh, here is that we've built in some wraparound services and we acknowledge that there are going to be impediments that folks are going to experience as they're uh, going through training, as they're going into employment, and we want to make sure that we're providing help with childcare, with um, transportation, with getting a uniform, getting equipment, getting whatever it is that would be the thing that that individual needs to help them be successful uh, in um, their jobs and in their careers. And ultimately, we want to say that that $20 per hour is really foundational, kind of back to the point that uh, Chris made about housing 
being foundational. I see ladder ladders of opportunity for residents to move from that twenty dollars up to forty and up to sixty and beyond. So I'm going to leave you with one last point. So I was recently on a construction site uh, in Reston. So what I've learned is I've got to look across this area and look for opportunities for our residents here in the uh, Richmond Highway Quarter. And that could mean helping them get a job somewhere outside the area. But while in Reston, I asked the developer, this is um, Chris Clemente, he's the developer of the Comstock development. It's the Wheatley Avenue station that is on the Silver Line. If anyone's been there, it is basically like a little city now. This was just basically a low rise uh, series of buildings for over 30 years. They took those buildings down and now they have the headquarters for Google. They have the folks from Microsoft. They now are building a new Ritz Carlton, which is gonna be a hotel plus a condominium first Ritz Carlton condominium project in this region in many, many years. So I asked him, who on this job site makes the most money? Just out of curiosity. And he says, look up there, you'll see a yellow crane. There's a guy that's 400 feet in the air. He makes the most money of anyone on the site. How much does he make? He says he makes $350,000 a year. He did not go to college, did not incur any debt and he makes $350,000 a year. We want to make sure that we have the opportunity to talk to our residents about all of the options that exist, welding, electrical, and possibly being a crane operator. Everybody can't climb 400 feet in the air and hang on a boom, but for those who can, for those who can, you'll be able to make a substantial amount of money. And I would be Smitten if I could say I make $350,000 a year, but no, I do not. And that's not going to happen because I'm not climbing up 400 feet. But we want to give our residents and those in our community an opportunity to learn about those types of jobs and for those who can to help them uh, move in that direction. So, with that, I'll conclude my remarks here uh, on the wish and uh, just look forward to the opportunity to talk with any of you take any of you on a tour so you can see the wish. I want to offer that. That's another reason why I'm here, so we can show you what the programs are, let you see some of the participants, and really see uh, what the actual vision and partnerships are. We have 19 different partners who are part of this uh, effort, and they're all listed and shown on our wall when you come into the lobby of the wish. So thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about something that I think is uh, hopefully going to make a difference in the lives of many in uh, South County. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Supervisor Lusk. We do have some questions in the chat. Sure. Are there any plans to extend the program outside of the current service area to other supervisory districts? Well, unfortunately, I won't be able to answer that. Um, I think what I, what I can say is that we are going to prove efficacy of this program first. Uh, we have some metrics and goals that we are uh, going to be reporting out on in terms of how many individuals have been served by the program, how many of them have gained employment, uh, what has been the, uh, the differential in the income that they were making before they came into the program versus what they're making after completing the program and starting their, uh, their jobs. We're going to track these residents for up to two years after they leave our center because we're going to want to get data and information to be able to uh, have some longitudinal uh, study uh, information that we can share uh, for others uh, about, the, about the program. So let's fast forward and say we've been able to prove efficacy, been able to show demonstrate that you know people have been able to uh, get jobs and, and improve uh, their quality of life as a result of being participants in the program I would then imagine that there could be opportunities for us to look at uh, expanding the program into other areas of uh, okay thank you and yes, so the second common is great program where is the center located how sure. does one go about making a referral? 
So the center is located in the Hyla Valley Community Center. So it's a community center in an opportunity of, uh, of need, an uh, opportunity neighborhood. So we're excited about the location because it makes it um, easier for those residents who live in this community to get access to the center. They can essentially walk to it. Uh, we have a 700 unit mobile home park that surrounds uh, the center. Uh, we also have another 91 unit mobile home park that's just down uh, off of uh, Richmond Highway, less than you know, 400 uh, uh, meters from this location. And we have a number of public housing and other affordable housing um, developments that are in the Buckman Jana Lee uh, loop. So there's thousands of people that can be served uh, in this immediate neighborhood. We're also going to be serving uh, some who are in the Mount Vernon district uh, in the Gum Springs area, uh, acknowledging that um, there are a number of folks there who would benefit from the services as well. And we are certainly uh, open, open to talking to uh, anyone that has interest in, you know, coming to the uh, site to see it and to learn if uh, they might be eligible to participate. Um, if you want to take a look at uh, melwood.org, um, they have a landing page that talks about the WISH. Um, the WISH is still finalizing its own, um, it's finalizing its own uh, website, but we do have a landing page which gives information about what I've just described and discussed here, and um, you can learn more details. Uh, additionally, I'm going to leave my my office number here is uh, 703 971 So please feel free to call uh, my office, and we will be happy to uh, arrange uh, an opportunity for a tour or to coordinate uh, if you have a participant who is interested in the program, coordinate their participation um, as well. So um, that's probably a more extensive answer than you were looking for. <laughs> well, thank you for the answer. We have another question. Sure. Um, what lessons have been learned from other similar programs in other counties or states and how are the pitfalls being avoided? No, I, I appreciate that question. Let me, let me be, uh, clear in saying this. Um, I mean, this program isn't really modeled on any other programs. And the reason that um, we didn't do that is we looked at this idea of actually focusing at the job first and working it backwards on the continuum to the person. So as opposed to basically putting a person into a training program and then having them go out and try to find a job, we've already talked to our partners and we've identified what jobs are available. And we are now saying um, Anova Health has patient navigators. Anyone that's interested in the patient navigator program, it's gonna be offered at the center and you can come into this four week program. And at the conclusion of it, they're gonna do interviews and they're gonna hire people. Boom, just simple. So it's not like we're gonna say, you need to go to Nova, you're gonna learn how to you know, do X, Y, and Z, and then you'll go and look for a job we've already got the job opportunity lined up first. The same with uh, working with the apprenticeship programs is that we have basically identified that there are certain apprenticeship areas where they are looking to find candidates. So carpenters, electricians, welders, all of these areas are in need of talented individuals who can come into these jobs. The thing that a lot of people don't realize is that these jobs have been viewed as more blue collar, more lower end jobs. But if we really want to make an admission here, these are the jobs that pay extremely competitively. And these are the jobs that do not put you in debt. And these are the jobs that have opportunities that are necessary today, that are needed today. So we are, again, trying to help our residents learn about these different positions and how they can become careers and how they can be um, laddered because you can have a welding certification and you can have a carpentry certification 
and you can have an electrical certification. You know, all three of those things in one person's skill set and toolbox. And when you go on a job site, imagine how easy it's going to be for you to get a job when you can say, I can do welding and I can do electrical and I can also do carpentry. So these are the types of things that we are, you know, again, trying to express to our um, residents and to give them uh, some knowledge about how competitively these jobs pay. The last thing I'll say here is that on, on the welding, welders can make, you know, $65 an hour if they have specialty skills. And it doesn't take a whole lot of time to become skilled in welding. Some people have it because it's kind of like patience and, and time that you have to be able to master. Um, someone's likened it to a hot glue gun. If you can operate a hot glue gun, you can be a welder. And I don't think many people would normally make that correlation uh, when they talk about welding. So we're letting them come into the center and we're letting them get their hands on the welding equipment, on the electrical equipment, on carpentry equipment, so that they can determine what things they're proficient in and what things they like and what things they want to pursue. Thank you. And then we have two more questions and we'll move to Tom Barnett. Oh my. I feel bad for Tom. Do you want me to stop here or how are so, we going? One quick question. Is there age restriction and um, have there been transportation challenges for people to get to Reston from your district? Uh, well, we haven't started the program yet with uh, Comstock, but we're talking to them right now. So we're trying to figure out how we can uh, get our folks trained so they can go work on job sites like Comstocks. I mean, I, I probably won't get them on the Comstock site immediately because we got to get them through the apprenticeship program and it takes months. But uh, the beauty is I want to know that we have a, a, a position for them ultimately to go into and that we've got partners who are saying, you bring me someone who's got these certifications of training, then I'll hire them. Um, so we're going to, I think I mentioned earlier, we're going to provide transportation uh, services and assistance for those who will need it. Um, and then um, age. So the age is um, interesting because we are actually providing services that have actually gotten even down to you know K through 12. So we've started by saying, we're gonna try to get um, some of our kids exposed to uh, STEAM, uh, STEM and arts. And we just did our first um, STEAM Fest event, uh, which was on October 15th, one week after we opened the center, we had this huge event. There were uh, over 300 uh, folks who attended. Uh, George Mason University was a sponsor of it, which was amazing. And we had uh, STEM NOLA, which is this uh, STEAM related uh, program come in. They built out 60 different stations and gave students the opportunity to get their hands on uh, applications that show combustion that show electricity, that show aerodynamics. They let them fly drones. We had drones inside of a cage, so they were controlled. The kids could fly them inside the cage through loops, and then they could land them. Uh, it was amazing. It was one of the best days I've had since I've been an elected official to walk in. And I mean, we opened the doors um, early that morning, and there were a line. There was a line of at least 100 kids trying to get into the center so they could participate in this uh, STEAM Fest. So we're working with kids K through 12. We're also gonna be partnering with high schools in the area, there's uh, six of them, that we're gonna be helping to uh, identify students who can come and have this experiential training opportunity at the WISH. And we're gonna be working with uh, their parents. So both kids and adults are gonna be serviced through this program. Thank you. And I put uh, Supervisor Lusk's phone number in the chat, um, and you yes. can also email him if you have any additional questions. Is that correct, Supervisor Lusk? Uh, sure, you can feel free. Um, um, you can reach me at uh, rodney.lusk at fairfaxcounty.gov. And I just put that in the chat as well. Um, thank you again.
very welcome. And now we will turn it over to Thomas Barnett so he can talk about the home op allocation plan, Tom. Good evening, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here tonight and to see you all. My name is Tom Barnett. I'm the Deputy Director of the Office to Prevent and End Homelessness in Fairfax County's Department of Housing and Community Development. And uh, I'm glad that you're here tonight to hear about an exciting program with a weird acronym, as many of our housing programs do. I'm going to put a link in the chat, um, which will provide more information about what's called the Home ARP program. And it's called uh, Home ARP because uh, this is an annual home investment partnerships program grant uh, that we received as a uh, county or jurisdiction of this size, uh, a special allocation through the American Rescue Plan, and that is the ARP part. This $7.9 million is an incredible opportunity for Fairfax County to reduce homelessness and increase housing stability. Um, it is a rare opportunity specifically to create housing for people at the lowest ends of the uh, income spectrum. You often hear all sorts of statistics thrown out there in terms of what is affordable, but many times communities like Fairfax County and every other jurisdiction across the country really struggle to serve populations that have incomes below 30% of the area median income. This program is designed to really create housing opportunities for that population. So I want to talk through some of the different possible uses for these funds. I want to talk about the consultation process that we have gone through uh, to develop an allocation plan. And as you'll see in this link, uh, you'll see a draft of that allocation plan. There is still an opportunity for you to provide comments and insights into the, the draft, uh, as you'll see in the, the instructions on the link. So to, to give you a sort of an overview of what these funds can be used for, they can, one, provide for the development and support of affordable rental housing. And this includes what's called permanent supportive housing, which is a research proven effective model of housing people who are chronically homeless and keeping them housed. Uh, it can also provide tenant-based rental assistance. It can provide supportive services. It can also go towards the acquisition and development of non-congregate shelter units. What does non-congregate mean? Well, many of you who have visited our shelters um, may have seen these sort of large congregate areas where people were sleeping in the same rooms. COVID, obviously, um, showed us the danger of sleeping many people in the same room where an infectious disease can spread quite rapidly. And so non-congregate shelter is something that many communities have been developing through home ARP money and many other funds to provide a more private, safe spaces um, for people experiencing homelessness. These funds can go towards supporting people who are literally homeless, also, people who are at risk of homelessness, those fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence, dating violence, sexual assault, stalking or human trafficking, and many other families that um, need housing or services in order to prevent their homelessness and those households with the greatest risk of, of housing instability. So really, there's a lot of control that the federal government has put into local communities' hands in terms of how they want to use these funds. To develop this draft allocation plan, we went through a consultation process where we met with over 20 different organizations through various methodologies beginning in early December. First, we held a forum uh, in person where we did breakout groups, kind of thinking about what are people seeing and hearing in their work around homelessness and housing instability. We have representatives from a wide variety of groups, including the Affordable Housing Advisory Council, the Disability Services Board, the Fair Housing Task Force, the Housing Authority, the Community Services Board, and many others. Um, we also, as an alternative, provided an evening virtual consultation meeting where we had even more people participating and more organizations represented 
including people who are actively experiencing homelessness right now that we're calling from shelters and providing their insights into what are their needs. Uh, we also provided surveys. So for folks that wanted to provide written comments rather than attend a meeting, they could do that. Um, and then there was a public hearing just last week with the Consolidated Community Funding Advisory Committee. Uh, we also conducted some interviews with groups that we wanted to make sure were represented and that the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development insisted be part of this process, including veteran service providers, domestic violence service providers, and other organizations such as those. The public comment period opened with last week's public hearing and goes through February 3rd. So I encourage you to take a look at this document and understand kind of what are the different uh, ways that we're expecting to be using these funds. Um, I want to highlight in particular, there are, um, there's a lot of great data in there. If you're interested in understanding what housing stability looks like in our community, we talk about not just people who are experiencing literal homelessness on any given night, but also the many thousands of people who are experiencing, uh, who are at risk of homelessness because of their extremely low incomes. Uh, those who are severely cost burdened, like what percentage of their income are they paying towards rent? We, we also address the disproportionality among people experiencing homelessness and at risk of homelessness, specifically the Black or African American population that um, is overly represented in the, this un housing unstable population that cannot simply be uh, explained by poverty uh, alone. It, it is, uh, it of course, caused by things like housing discrimination, employment discrimination, lack of access to opportunities. So there's a lot of great data there. Uh, we provide a lot of examples and uh, summaries of some of the comments that we heard during the consultation sessions. I think I, I, I want to share with you some of the themes that I heard. Um, in addition to a lack of housing for people at the lowest income spectrums, they, uh, many of the people who participated in the consultation session said that this third year of the pandemic in many ways is the worst when it comes to housing crises. Um, during the first year or two, there were many protections in place, such as um, eviction moratoriums, tens of millions of dollars, as Chris Leonard said, uh, in eviction prevention assistance. Um, those moratoriums and many of those dollars are quickly disappearing, not just here in Fairfax County, but across the country. And as a result, we're seeing increases in evictions and more people experiencing homelessness which is why these types of funds are so important. Um, chronic homelessness, which are people with disabilities who have experienced homelessness for an extended period of time is, is most significantly increasing during the, the pandemic. And that is why we are uh, proposing to prioritize the use of these funds to creating housing for people experiencing chronic homelessness, people with disabilities, people who have no other options of where to go and are, are remaining homeless for years. So I want to give you a bit of an overview, and you can see this in the allocation plan on page 30. It's sort of a draft budget. Um, what we've done is, is kind of split out the funds to provide the types of housing services that we know work in reducing homelessness. Supportive services, over $2 million has been dedicated towards supportive services. $2 million also has been dedicated to the acquisition and development of non-congregate shelters. And then $2.7 million for the uh, development and acquisition of affordable rental housing, specifically in the form of permanent supportive housing. Many times these projects and types of shelter and housing can be developed co-located, uh, not just with housing, but with other types of public facilities. Um, obviously, in a rapidly urbanizing community, we want to make sure that we're taking, uh, maximizing the use of available public land um, and, and being most efficient with the development of that. 
Um, and so we could see these things paired together, not just with shelter or housing, but with other public services. Uh, we're also including hundreds of thousands of dollars to support nonprofit operating expenses, as well as administrative expenses, which are essential um, to the, the use of these grant funds, both in the county and at the nonprofits. Um, so we're very excited um, that we already have 88 units of permanent supportive housing in the pipeline. Um, throughout the Fairfax County community. Um, one of those projects is on West Stocks Road, uh, Cornerstones, which is based out of the Reston area, has 34 units that they are uh, currently working with the Housing Authority on developing. This is on Housing Authority land, and they're leveraging that to create new housing opportunities. Similarly, in the city of Fairfax, the Lamb Center and Wesley Housing are in a joint project to develop 55 units of permanent supportive housing, which they just recently went through a strenuous land use process with their uh, city council and mayor and the, the constituents there in the city of Fairfax, and, and they were successful in getting approval to move forward with that project. This would be the biggest permanent supportive housing that's ever been created as a single facility within our community. So we're very excited about that, but we're gonna leverage these dollars to try to do those and more um, so that we can house more people experiencing homelessness that have been on our streets for years. And surely you have, have probably seen them, um, not just panhandling, but also sleeping in cars, sleeping in bus stops, um, the need is real, he, even here in one of the wealthiest communities in the United States. And I'd be remiss to, to say, um, well, to go through this presentation and not thank you, the faith community and our partners, and being a part of our hypothermia prevention program for over 15 years now. Um, back in 2005, because of the deaths of people experiencing homelessness in the cold, the hypothermia prevention program was created in partnership with nonprofits and the faith community to make sure that during the coldest months, no one had to sleep outside and be at risk of serious injury or death due to the cold. And the program has been a tremendous success, not just in terms of saving lives, but as a demonstration of what uh, partnerships can do um, and, and reducing homelessness. Um, so we're very proud of that. We hope for the day where really shelter is no longer necessary, um, but until that day comes, it's very important that we provide safe access to shelter. And, and this HYPO program has been an important part of that. And in many ways, the faith community has led the county's efforts to, to serve people experiencing homelessness. The first shelters back in the 80s were, were started in local churches and other houses of worship, and, and that's really, um, and then demanded that the county government step up and continue that effort. And so I thank you for spending this time with me tonight. Um, there's a lot of details I didn't go over here, but I think it'd be better if we can engage a little bit of dialogue where I can at least uh, answer any of your questions. And if um, you don't have any now, please feel free to write in to the email address uh, that you see on that link. And we'll be happy to respond or at least to include your comments in our final plan. Thank you, Tom. Does anyone have any questions? That was a very detailed presentation. There are some questions in the chat. Sure, I'll Would go you... ahead and type my email address right in the chat um, as I'm responding to the second question. But when is the point in time count this year? And I love that someone is so keyed into to what's happening around homelessness that they know that that time is coming again. So uh, for everyone's information, every year, going back probably decades now, um, Fairfax and communities all across the country do a count of everyone who is experiencing literal homelessness, not just sheltered, but unsheltered. And this is what's called the point in time count. And this has been the most consistent uh, sort of measure as to how are we doing as a country in 
reducing homelessness. And the, those numbers have gone up and down. Most recently here in Fairfax County, they increased during the pandemic, but slightly decreased just this past year. We will <clears throat> have to wait and see at this next count um, what it, is it going to mean. So to answer the question specifically, the point in time count is not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow. So that's Wednesday, um, January 25th is the point in time count. Um, unlike many urban communities where they engage a large core of volunteers to canvas a community block by block, we primarily rely on professional outreach workers and staff in the shelters to do the count. Um, however, I know that uh, the Lamb Center, which is the largest drop-in, daytime drop-in center, does use volunteers sometimes to survey folks who come in to the drop-in center in the days following the point in time, time count to ask, where were you sleeping that night? Did we miss you? you know, were you sleeping outside or in, in a shelter? Um, so January 25th is the count. Typically, the results are not shared until the spring. Um, and then nationwide um, about a year later. Um, so uh, if you're interested in learning more about the data here locally, you can go to our website, fairfaxcounty.gov slash homeless, and you'll see links not just to that point in time data going back more than 10 years, but also um, how do you access services and um, including the hypothermia prevention program. Um, so I'll actually put that link in uh, the chat as well, uh, just because there's a great flyer um, with information on the different sites, uh, locations throughout the county, which organizations are hosting them, uh, contact information. So if you have folks that are coming into your house of worship throughout the week looking for shelter, uh, or calling, this is great information to be able to provide them. Nobody has to be sleeping outside in the cold in Fairfax County during the winter months. Um, so. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions for Tom? Tom, I have a question. I just want to reiterate, you would like for uh, people to go on the website to provide public comments? Yes, I mean, certainly if, um, I, I think it'd be, be great if you could read the allocation plan, you can understand sort of the scope of the housing crisis that is not that is here in Fairfax County and across the country to, in terms of the numbers. You could learn more about what's the, the, what are people who are serving people in crisis, seeing and hearing. And if you have, if there's something to add, please jump in. Don't feel obligated, but we, we'd love to hear what you're hearing. Okay, thank you. Just checking to make sure I don't see any hands or there are no comments um, in the chat. Does anyone have any last questions uh, for either Supervisor Lusk since he's still on the call? Okay, well, I want to say thank you to all of our speakers, Tom, Supervisor Lusk, and uh, Chris Leonard, for this information. I found it very helpful and informative, um, and I'm hoping you all did too. Please make sure you um, check the chat for contact information um, in case you think of a question later and you want to reach out to them. Uh, there is a survey. I think Caroline just put the survey in the chat because we would love your feedback on this session. The recording will be sent out um, this week so you can share it with um, someone who missed it. And uh, Caroline put the, the link to the recording um, in the chat. The recording won't be up until later this week. I see Charles Hodge, you have a question? You want to unmute yourself or you're just waving? Maybe he was just waving. Um, also, there's a link in the chat. If you're not subscribed to the Common Ground, I encourage you strongly to subscribe to the Common Ground newsletter. And I do have a bit of housekeeping. There's some changes for this year of 2023, new year, new beginnings. We will be doing the Common Ground newsletter every other month 
not every month. Um, so the next edition will be out in February. And then we will be having our FCIA networking meetings every other month also. So we're having this one today. The next one will be on March the 15th. Um, it'll be on the environment, which is one of my favorite things. So you will be hearing from me and I'm going to encourage everyone to put it on your calendar now to come to the March 15th FCIA networking meeting. Um, I hope to see you all there. And um, if no one has any last minute comments, let me just check the chat. If there are things. Uh, oh, Fazia uh, has her solidarity tea. Fazia, I see you put that in the chat. Do you want to um, say something about that? Unmute yourself. Gosh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, I just wanted to remind everyone that on the third Saturday every month, Dara Hidra has Solidarity uh, Interfaith Cup of Tea. You're all welcome. It's from two to four. Take a break on a Saturday afternoon. Stop in and have tea and conversation about community issues. It is on the common ground. And um, yeah, I just wanted to remind people that on Saturday, if you're out and about, stop in Dara Hedra between two and four. Uh, this Saturday coming will be the third Saturday. And I hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you, Fazia. Um, and I don't think I thanked Reverend Trish again for the opening prayer. So thank you again for that. And um, if no one has any last minute comments, we can adjourn. Reverend Trish says, wait. You gonna, are you unmuting? Oh, I was trying to. <laughs> oh, the wonderful frustrations. I just want to uh, make a quick announcement about uh, on uh, February 5th, uh, Tyson's Interfaith will be hosting an online discussion of reconnecting post-pandemic uh, for faith uh, communities to um, share what's working, what's not working, how different or uh, similar their community looks now in the post-pandemic uh, era, and uh, look at how we can support one another, learn with and from one another, and um, uh, support our populations with good, strong faith communities. Thank you. All Thank right, you. well, I would say good evening to everyone and enjoy the rest of your night. See you in March. Thank you, Suzette. Thank you. Take care. Thank you.